What is it that governs the Englishman? Certainly not intelligence, seldom passion, hardly self-interest, since what we call self-interest is nothing but some dull passion served by a brisk intelligence. The Englishman's heart is perhaps capricious or silent. It is seldom designing or mean. There are nations where people are always innocently explaining how they have been lying and cheating in small matters to get out of some predicament or secure some advantage. That seems to them a part of the art of living. Such is not the Englishman's way. It is easier for him to face or to break opposition than to circumvent it. If we try to say that what governs him is convention, we should have to ask ourselves how it comes about that England is the paradise of individuality, eccentricity, heresy, anomalies, hobbies and humours. Nowhere do we come oftener upon those two social abortions, the affected and the disaffected. Where else would a man inform you, with a sort of proud challenge, that he lived on nuts, or was in correspondence through a medium with Sir Joshua Reynolds, or had been disgustingly housed when last in prison? Where else would a young woman, in dress and manners the close copy of a man, tell you that her parents were odious, and that she desired a husband but no children, or children without a husband. It is true that those novelties soon become the conventions of some narrower circle, or may even have been adopted en bloc in emotional desperation, as when people are converted, and the oddest sects demand the strictest self-surrender. Nevertheless, when people are dissident and supercilious by temperament, they manage to wear their uniforms with a difference, turning them by some lordly adaptation into a part of their own person. Let me come to the point boldly. What governs the Englishman is his inner atmosphere, the weather in his soul. It is nothing particularly spiritual or mysterious. When he has taken his exercise and is drinking his tea or his beer and lighting his pipe, when in his garden or by his fire he sprawls in an aggressively comfortable chair, when, well washed and well brushed, he resolutely turns in church to the east and recites the creed, with genuflections, if he likes genuflections, without in the least implying that he believes one word of it, when he hears or sings the most crudely sentimental and thinnest of popular songs, unmoved but not disgusted, when he makes up his mind who is his best friend or his favourite poet, when he adopts a party or a sweetheart, when he is hunting or shooting or boating or striding through the fields, when he is choosing his clothes or his profession, Never is it a precise reason, or purpose, or out of fact, that determines him. It is always the atmosphere of his inner man. Instinctively, the Englishman is no missionary, no conqueror. He prefers the country to the town, and home to foreign parts. He is rather glad and relieved if only natives will remain natives, and strangers strangers, and at a comfortable distance from himself. Yet outwardly, he is most hospitable, and accepts almost anybody for the time being. He travels and conquers without a settled design, because he has the instinct of exploration. His adventures are all external. They change him so little that he is not afraid of them. He carries his English weather in his heart wherever he goes, and it becomes a cool spot in the desert, and a steady and sane oracle amongst all the deliriums of mankind. Never since the heroic days of Greece has the world had such a sweet, just, boyish master. It will be a black day for the human race when scientific blackguards, conspirators, churls and fanatics manage to supplant him.